All right, just go ahead if you wouldn't mind dropping in the chat um, your name and what you teach or what your job is. I feel like I should know that for half of you already because I've been in repeated sessions with you, but my memory is not as good as all that. Um, the session is Classroom Management in the Inclusion Classroom. My name is Christina and I am a staff developer at IU12 in the area of behavior. So um, hello staff, welcome. Hi Brittany again. Hi Ben again. Logan, Tabitha, welcome. Elena. Awesome. Some of you I think I'd know by faith too. Nancy, welcome. Maybe a few more people. Go ahead and drop your name in there and tell us who you are and what you do. And we will get started. So I'm starting out with the uh, norms that we've all looked at as well. And here's my contact info. I will go back to that at the end in case anybody wants to write down my email and contact me. Um, here are our meeting norms. Like I said, be sure to have your chat open and be um, meaningfully engaged. I uh, would love to see your face if you'd be comfortable with sharing that because I need feedback. That's just me as a human being. And sometimes that means you're smiling and sometimes that means you're going like this to look for something and that's okay. Um, totally looks different for everyone. Um, we're honoring all perspectives. Hopefully we hear different perspectives in the room. I'd love to know your thoughts and questions as we go on. It's a small group. So feel free to um, says Logan. I think we're seeing the wrong presentation. Did everybody, well, that's a good important thing to tell me. Is this where you plan to be right now? Classroom management, the inclusion classroom? Is that what you're seeing on the screen? Classroom management and the inclusion classroom? No. Are you seeing Summer Institute support effective? Aha. Okay. You people are so awesome. Thank you. Let me share the proper screen. That's going to be super important. Logan, you get the prize today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Courage is so important, that professional courage. Okay. Um, are we now seeing Summer Institute classroom management in the inclusion classroom? Good. Thank you. All right. So here's my information. Here is the norms that I had just talked about. And remember your Act 48 requirements and to get your books as well. Awesome. Thanks everybody for dropping in who you are and what you do. I really appreciate that. So our outcomes for this webinar are to assess your currently in place classroom management strategies, to articulate the essential basics of behavioral theory. Sounds riveting, right? All right, we, we're gonna love it. Um, to describe the evidence-based practices of classroom management, okay? So this is not going to be, I mean, we could go on about classroom management forever, and some of you have much more experience in it than I, but what I hope this session is is interactive and helps you to self-assess a little bit and just um, develop a, a reflective practice, and then identify some next steps as well. So drop in the chat, try to challenge yourself for one to two words only. Um, one word, dot, 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 another word. How you're feeling right now and one that describes how you'd like to be feeling by the end of this presentation. I'd like to check in in this same way. Comfort uh, routines give us comfort, help us know what to expect, reduce anxiety, and these are things to do with kids as well. Somehow, sometimes starting and ending the same way every time is really helpful. Steph, I'm wondering if a child drew your caricature that is um, your away photo. I love it. Go ahead and drop those one words in the chat. One word how, of how you're feeling now and one word of how you would like to feel by the end of this session. Trina, I am not a miracle worker, but I will try, sweetheart. Cool. <laughs> yeah, some sessions actually bring up anxiety because you have you leave with a lot of more questions. And we should call that curiosity, but sometimes we also call it anxiety. Overwhelmed, peaceful, sorry, not one word. Oh, that's okay, Nancy, you're good. Sometimes that's not possible. I never said one word about anything ever my whole life, so it's all good. 
All right, so let's move on forward and try to get you to those end goals you have. So here's the truth of the matter, right? I mean, they did not teach you this in your pre-service teacher courses of what to do when it's happening like that, okay? Um, so, you know, you cannot peel every layer of the onion at once and classroom management is an art. So the way to not feel overwhelmed by it, and this is what I say about every PD I attend or others attend, if you can pick up one thing to take with you that encourages you or challenges you or gives you a new idea, that's fantastic. Over, the, over your practice as a teacher, you'll pull thousands of things like that together and it will become who you are as an educator. So don't feel overwhelmed about material. Feel encouraged with something small you can take with you. It's the same with classroom management. If you try to fix all that's going on at that doorway at one time, um, I know it feels pretty urgent, but you can't fix it all at once, okay? So we have to be thoughtful in our approach. So let's get right to work self-assessing, okay? So you're gonna need some scratch paper. Um, and I wanna let you know that these resources are right in the folder for handouts as well, but I'm gonna show them to you on the screen. You're gonna use some scratch paper to self-assess. So I'll give you 10 seconds of silence to get what you need. All right, good to go. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to self-assess. Ben and Trina, you good to go? You're ready to self-assess? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. Um, so here is a very quick self-assessment. So rate your overall classroom behavior on a scale of one to five. Now I know it's before school year starts. You're going to have to take yourself back there, how you were feeling at the end of last year. Okay. If you run a school, if you run a district, I know it's hard, a, a hard transfer, but try to transfer it. So when I was a building principal before this, this was my, uh, the gig very prior to this, I can, it's like yesterday, it's like riding a bike. I can totally um, rate the overall school behavior on a scale of one to five. It's not going to be perfect, but try to generalize that. You could do a simple rating like this three to five times per year and just be honestly where it is in life is the consistency and the, the follow through. So if you put this on a calendar, and you self-rate, it's going to encourage you. Now, does it change anything, the rating? No, it's going to encourage you to look for what will change the rating though. So it's a reminder. Assessment is a reminder and it's a read on progress, okay? So that's a very quick one, but let's go into a deeper one. This comes from the Classroom Management Desk Reference from Patton. They get their information in that publication from a lot of different places, but they have a pretty good um, instructional practices for effective classroom management survey. So I want you to go through, I know these are not numbered, but just go ahead and give yourself points one to three, your environment. It's not anybody's fault or anybody's um, own work, what each of these says, but it is what it is. So let's self rate. Give you a few seconds to rate all of them on this screen. So when I think about how Elena might be rating, maybe Elena pick um, a classroom that you've been in a lot if you'd like to use that for fodder. Um, I know it's not self-assessment exactly, or you could try and rate the whole school or a particular grade that you're thinking of. Um, same with any principals who might be in the room, yes or no, just looking through, no. We have some transition, we have Yes, that's great. Um, I'd love to hear, Eleni, I hope I'm saying that correctly, some feedback from you at the end on how your environment is different in the ratings you're giving versus others and the implications for that. 
super for today. And then stuff, even thinking about a building that you've been in or a grade level that you can um, know you were recently in a building. So when you are ready for me to move on to the next slide, can you give me a thumbs up? There's one more page of items to rate. Take your time. Okay, I see a couple thumbs up. Logan, Eleni, Ben, and Trina looking good. Trina, you're ready. Eleni, good. Okay. Oh, Eleni, was that a sideways? Like, give me a minute, or was that a thumbs up? Up. It was up. Okay. Yes, I see you, dear. Okay. Perfect. All right, let's go ahead on. So here's the next slide. Give me a thumbs up when you're done with this page as well, if you wouldn't mind. If you didn't give me a thumbs up already and you're getting finished, go ahead and give me that. Saw everybody but a couple, I think. So, okay, cool. Awesome. I want to go back to the prior page and see what the total possible was. So 14, 15, total of 15. So 45 is the total possible points. Am I right? Is my math right? Yeah. Thanks, Eleni. Appreciate that. So you could see, again, the key here is progress monitor. You know, you've got this baseline. It's perception data. You don't have a peer rating it. It's not empirical rating of any sort, but it's a self-perception, and it is super important to have that um, reflective practice that you are digging into. Um, if you were with us yesterday, you learned a lot about some evidence-based strategies from Dr. Lane that may not be represented here in their articulated form, like opportunities to respond and behavior specific praise, but you can see the meat of them in there, like kind of the description of what they are. So um, you're seeing that that info has been tried and true over time, but then there are some new things that Dr. Lane at all have picked up on and have um, laid out in her book. So please ask me if you need some of those materials as well. But what could you do as part of reflective practice? Consider repeating this two more times this year and keep that rating handy. How will you measure outcomes is a question we need to think about, but importantly, think about the changes to celebrate your culture. So maybe was there one or two of those that were really high? And let's look back and see what they were. So look back over where your threes were. So here's the first slide. Um, so where were your threes? And on the next slide, what were your threes? And then what were the ones that were really low? I know you don't have it right in front of you, but like I said, it is in your folder as well. But what were the ones that were really low as you look through here? So here's slide one, and then I'm gonna put up slide two in a second. I'd love you to drop in the chat, you know, which ones were more difficult? What are, what are the ones that you think you need some help on or that most people might need some help on?
ones or twos, any areas you'd plop in the chat there? That's my cat. When she's hungry, she's super loud. You're going to hear her. So I'm not seeing much in the chat there, but I'd love to know how will you measure outcomes? Time is something everyone struggles with. Yep. How will you measure outcomes? So is this the only measure of outcomes for an effectively managed classroom? What are some other ways you can measure those outcomes? Progress monitoring of what? Can you give us a little more? Okay, number of office referrals. Can I do it this way? Because it's too Please. hard for me to type. Yeah. I, uh, I progress monitor for, for math and reading, basically. So I, we do like for computation fluency for all the different things. But I also do, um, there's different ways to progress monitor, like as far as like your visuals, your things, how the kids are doing, their body language, like uh, whenever you are doing something and you know that the material is harder because they're looking, you know, you can tell the non-verbals. And so you have to back up. And so that yeah. was like a visual progress monitoring that I'm doing like over, as I, as I say, as I teach. And then you gotta go back up and, and redo, you know, and retouch that maybe in a different way, things like that. Um, one of the questions that you put in here, which one was like the twos? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, what I found in, in this particular room is that I have um, material that uh, might not be as in like, um, what do you call it in at, at their levels, like certain instructional mm -hmm. levels. I found material that I have that is way too low for some, too, too low. And then the others are way too high. So that's what I've been struggling for the past couple of years mm -hmm. to find materials. Yes, I see. Uh, for myself you know, to be able to incorporate from my varied kids. I might have like 10 kids, but they're all like this far in the spectrum. You know, there's, I don't have that many that are like within the same similar area that I can use the same type of um, material with them, you know? Yeah, and so important when you think about engagement is the fit of the material with a just right difficulty level for them. Fantastic, you picked up on a lot of good things there. Um, and I saw a couple of other things in the chat too. You know, in all my time as a teacher, I don't remember ever looking at the number of office referrals I had completed um, in various quarters of the year perhaps, or how many per student. And if that was nil for me or very low, what are some other things I can look at as a teacher? Is there any positive reinforcement data that I can measure that I'm giving out? Is it dojo points? Is it tickets for this or that? Am I documenting what's happening and the things we're celebrating as well as the things that we need some more help on? the outlying things or the things that are not going quite as well. And it's all about, you know, continuing to improve. So if you feel like you have a decent handle on classroom management, you know, how can we continue to refine it and help kids be more engaged? And that's one good way is instructional match with the materials. Absolutely. So, um, you know, yeah, the idea here is various measures of these outcomes, not just your own perception, but other uh, data that you can look at to get at your fingertips. Yeah, getting your student's opinion via a Google form. That's awesome. And, you know, asking kids, you know, in the varied supervision models I've been in when I was a teacher and school counselor, um, it was such a good experience for me to have kids tell me their opinion of an activity or their, you know, opinion of the classroom culture or whatever it might be. And I thought, oh my gosh, I should do this all the time. And many of you do have that as part of your current practice, I'm sure, where you're self-assessing kids on how they're feeling. Um, I guess you'd call that the social validity measures. So to use Dr. Lane's um, vernacular from yesterday, all of those strategies on the CI3T website all have a social validity scale so that the kids can rate how that strategy feels to them. Uh, what they liked and didn't like about it. And that's going to be a rich source of information as well. Okay, so what are the essential basics of classroom management? All right, so foundationally, the basic understandings of behavior are the ABC. So before I get into that, can you give me a thumbs up if you already know this, if you already are solid about antecedent behavior and consequence, you feel solid, because I'm not going to waste a lot of time on it if that's the case. I want to differentiate for you. Okay, a couple of you feel solid. Okay, give it like three more seconds and assume that only two of you feel solid. Okay, 
So let me explain a tiny bit then. So the ABC is the antecedent behavior and consequence. Um, I got this uh, for from ABA services and they, it, maybe it's a British spelling here. I don't know. Is that silly for me to say British spelling? You know what I mean, right? Some, some cultures use a different spelling of antecedent. So it is different here, but this was the best quick visual I could find. What happened prior to the behavior of concern, the behavior of concern, and what happened after the behavior of concern, okay? Or the behavior that we're interested in. You can analyze positive behaviors from this too, to look at the conditions for what's going well. What happened prior to the behavior we're interested in? What is the behavior we're interested in? What happened after the behavior? And is that different than an applied penalty? Is the consequence, when you look purely at that terminology, different than, a, than, a, than an applied penalty? Yes, because the consequence is simply what happened after the behavior was demonstrated. Was there a natural consequence of those actions? We often forget to look at, if you stood back far away from that situation and looked at what happened right afterwards, it's not quite as simple as saying, well, they lost a point, right? Because what else happened? You know, what else is happening? Because in that question, what else is happening is a really good nugget of information about how you can change the behavior of concern, okay? So we've got to look at more of a comprehensive approach to the consequence. So more about that. I probably already said all this just now. Consequences that give rewards increase a behavior, okay? I'll show you that said in a few different ways here, but basically reinforcement is when what happens afterwards makes that behavior continue to happen again and again. Consequences that give punishments decrease a behavior, okay? Example of this, um, if I have a great driving record, I have a better rate on my insurance. Is this reinforcement or punishment? Drop in the chat or unmute or whatever. If I have a great driving record, I get a better rate on my insurance. That's reinforcement. Yep, awesome, reinforcement. And if I am driving poorly, I get a ticket. Reinforcement or punishment? That's a punishment. That's a punishment, absolutely. So the difference in that is usually pretty clear to us, but we don't often think of it when we're trying to change behavior. So we've got to get it at the forefront a little more. But I love this one. Consequences that neither give rewards or punishments may extinguish a behavior. And I hope that you geek out over this and remind yourself of this later tonight when you're dealing with your own kid. We can take a timeout from reinforcement. It's a timeout from reinforcement, not a timeout from the student or a timeout so the teacher gets a break or a timeout so the student can work quietly. That's different. It's a timeout to break the cycle. Okay, so that has a possible chance of extinguishing the behavior. Have you heard that terminology before, extinguishing the behavior? So rather than punishing it out of them, it's just withholding any kind of reinforcement, anything that you could impose, okay? Or if you could control the environment, this equates to how about when you have a student that shows a repetitive behavior and you tell the other kids not to respond? You get what I'm saying? You tell them maybe, hopefully, non-verbally, right? Hopefully, maybe you've had a class meeting and you've handled it carefully. You know, hopefully there's ways you're doing it that are respectful, but that's what you're aiming for with this. You're trying to extinguish the behavior, taking time out from reinforcing what happened. Another way to say reinforcement, any action that follows a behavior and increases the likelihood that that behavior will occur again. What is the only way to know if a consequence is actually a reinforcement? So you apply a consequence, was it a reinforcement or was it not? Can I, it, can I answer that? Did it happen again? Absolutely. So this looks like data collection, right? Doesn't have to be scary and big. It's just, did it happen again? Did it work? And not the gut feeling about it either. The actual charting it somehow. It can be super simple. You can have somebody else collect data. You could have, uh, you know, yourself, you could chart just a specific time of the day, um, just a specific situation. Eleni, was there anything you wanted to add? Were you just agreeing? Did it happen again? Gotcha. Perfect. So that's the only way to know is to, to see, to look at what happens afterwards. Like, do I happen to know, now some of you were in my earlier session today, does, 
I was bringing up an example of how my kiddo is in preschool and they were trying to tell me to get him there earlier. I know Corinne will think this is funny. So I'm like not a morning person. So when I had this month off this summer, I wasn't getting him there very early. And one day the teacher had one of the uh, assistant directors tell me, you know, he really behaves better during lunchtime if he's there earlier in the day. So he can get used to this structure and this and that. And were we implying that I have no structure at home? Maybe or maybe not. Anyway, so the teacher had the director tell me this. Well, I did a little, little better for a couple of days. Um, now we're doing great because I'm back to work. So I get pictures over tadpoles showing me all the great academic stuff he's doing between 8 and 10, 10 a.m. Well, that is a super high reinforcer for me because my educator heart is like, oh my goodness, Paul's writing his name several times early in the morning. And I tell my husband, look at what he missed from 8 to 10 all these other days, right? That is more reinforcing to me than the punishment. The teacher might not know that unless they start to see a change in the pattern or unless they actually did it on purpose, reinforcing me that way. I truly doubt that, but maybe, I don't know, maybe they thought, and I tell them these things, I actually tell the directors and the teachers, show me something good and it's gonna reinforce the good things my child is doing, right? And the good things I'm doing. So sometimes you have to try out something and then measure the result. But the other reason for this result is I'm back to work, right? So that forced me to change the habits as well. All right. So more about compliance. I would like you to look at this. I'm going to put it on the screen, but you can also get it from the folder of handouts. I would love you to look through these because I love this list. It's super unscholarly to be honest, but I, um, I really like it. So I'm gonna open it up for you. Hopefully you can see this. So Miranda, are you here in a second? The wheel is turning. Is it a black screen? Yeah. And you see them now? Cool. Now let me just expand them in size and see what feels comfortable. How's that? Good? Okay. Awesome. So go ahead and just skim through those. I'll give you a second to look at numbers one through four, maybe one minute or two, and then I'll scroll down. Stop me if I'm scrolling down too quickly, but I think you might have had enough time. So let me go to numbers, put it about here. There we go. So go ahead and drop in the chat when you're ready. Was one of these a great reminder for you or a, an aha? That's why I show this list because even though it's not super empirical, it's just useful. So you're referring to number six, maybe Trina, please start your arithmetic assignment. Yeah, they probably these days recommend not saying arithmetic too, <laughs> right? <laughs> so some of these are maybe a little old, but um, you know, nonetheless, so I get the thing about please. And you know, what's funny about that? 
um, or number one, back to where it's suggested not to ask. Yeah, because that's kind of the other side of that, you know, don't ask, just tell. And let, if you're giving an option, maybe you ask. If you're okay with a no, maybe you ask. But if you want it to be done, maybe you tell specifically and calmly and with the right amount of information for the student. And again, back to like, how do we know it's going to work? measure it. Did it work? Is that what works with that learner? And thinking about the cultural differences, sometimes um, kids need the direct approach because they're used to it. Um, there was a fantastic story that Andrea Davis told, and she was at the PBIS Implementers Forum last year. And um, she wrote this poem called I Am Somebody, and she's a cultural lead um, in the Midwest. And she's just fantastic in her work on equity. And she's talking about how a little black child was being uh, defiant in the classroom, the teacher perceived, and was telling the parent that he was defiant. And the mom was like, well, that's interesting because he's not at home. How many times we've heard that? Like a thousand, right? Well, most of the time it's probably true. So it's just that we have to figure out what's different in the home conditions. It's not always what we think. You might um, assume that, well, at home it's wild. Well, the parent Kept, what, did, what did she do? She did what any of us would do. We spied, right? She spied. So she went to pick up the, the kindergarten. I think it was like kindergartner. And when she picked him up, for some reason, she had the opportunity to see what was happening at circle time. She had to pick him up early one day. And she heard the, the teacher ask him to do something actually in a way that was like, would you like to? Would you like to blank blank? And the child said, no. <laughs> He didn't say, no, you nasty this. He didn't say, I'm not doing anything you said. He just said no, politely. And the parent's like, oh, I get it now, you know? So she says to the teacher, hey, you know what? This will completely go away if you just tell him exactly what you want him to do. Up close, quiet, and directive. That is what he is used to. That is what he needs. Teacher did it. No more problems. So you know what we perceive as defiance or disrespect may be very different depending upon the kid and their, what they're used to. Um, compare maybe for attention reasons. Okay, I love the ratio of positive to negative, Nancy said. With responsive classroom, the focus is on effective language. Corinne, tell us more. Like you, what you want it to look like, what you want it to sound like, that kind of thing. Yeah, you want um, all of your statements to be in a positive nature and um, you know, you're literally pointing out whatever positive thing that you want to happen. So, mm -hmm. hey, Paul, I really liked when you showed respect by coming in and sitting down at the lunch table um, after washing your hands. You know, something like that where you're explicitly telling them exactly what you liked to see and what you expected to see mm -hmm. and um, praising them for it instead of saying, please do this, or, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's still a piece of it that's like, thank you and whatnot, yeah. but yeah. it also goes with like character education where you're pointing out the traits that, that you like. You yeah, and also um, yesterday in one of the sessions, I showed a little video of a skilled teacher who was teaching um, kindergarten math and she was talking about, she, she did a pretty deep lesson. It was definitely higher thinking. She was having kids being active and there were tons of transitions and tons of activity from the kids and they were explaining difficult concepts. But, um, you know, number nine, it was so true on that. What I had the folks do was, if any of you were in there, remember this, like, um, were there any missed opportunities for behavior specific praise in that situation? And there were lots of them. You got the idea by the end of it, even though, I mean, I'd love my kid to be in her class. Those kids were definitely learning, but she gave very little specific praise when things were going well. Um, she let there be silence when things were going well, instead of specifically praising what they were doing. And they were doing amazing stuff. So there was a lot to be able to praise. All right, cool. So moving on, I love these nine variables. Um, it's just something I try to continue to remind people of. Hopefully you can see this slide with a little finger pointing in the green thing. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So how can I get my students to do more of what is expected more often? <laughs> you know, that's all what we're all thinking, right? Um, point out what they're doing right. So research indicates that you can improve behavior by 80% just by pointing out what someone is doing correctly. It's huge. Um, and behavior specific praise goes right along with what Corinne was saying. You, you use it this way. These are some good examples of behavior specific praise. It can be done for a whole um, group of students or just one student. And it really gets it to the personal level when you're praising. 
So this praise to correction ratio. Some of my slides say five to one, some say four to one. So there's both out there. PBIS, which is what I train a lot, recommends five to one. And there's new research that shows it needs to be that high. Um, so you can definitely, you know, think about a classroom ticket or reinforcement system that you would set up um, that you could actually then measure, you know, how high is my acknowledgement to correction. Um, you could measure it in a school-wide system by looking at maybe the most um, needy students behaviorally by office discipline referral. This is something Steph may be even thinking a district approach. You know, can you take those, the neediest 10% behaviorally and then look at the school-wide data because you guys are very steeped in PBIS, the data for the uh, P5 and say, okay, the number of P5 tickets they have in a quarter versus the number of office discipline referrals in a quarter, this is now a ratio of acknowledgement to correction on a school-wide scale for that student. So you can begin to measure what your ratio looks like um, in school-wide behavior as well. So praise and relationship. I'm not going to spend much time on this because some of you have been in my other sessions and I think it's so important that I have it in all of them is to think of a student who exhibits a lot of behavioral excitement and rate your quality of relationship with that learner on a scale of one to four and then to identify a couple of positive things you can do um, to improve that relationship. And like I've said before, it's the implementation where we fall through. So maybe setting yourself a timer um, or setting yourself um, a reminder on a calendar of when to do those those things that are implicit and planned um, for improving that relationship with a learner because the effect size um, is high when it's near 0.8 and this is certainly high and the average effect size of all the other interventions studied was only near 0.4 but the adult the teacher student relationship was that much higher than all of the other interventions studied. And this was through Hattie's studies in 2009. I'm sure there are even more recent ones that do back this up as well. This was one of the largest studies on this. So as a check for understanding, um, I don't expect you to put it in the chat, but if you have some paper there, jot down a quick explanation of one of these concepts, the ABCs of behavior, reinforcement, or praise to cor correction ratio. I'm gonna give you two minutes, I'll set a timer, so that I make sure I give you silence, which is what we all need sometimes. Okie dokie, my timer just rang, just so good because I have no concept of time. So I would not have given you enough time, I don't think, without that. All right, so that is um, just helps me know that you're feeling like you understand at least the basics to be able to explain because this is as much about you being able to coach others as well. 
So here are some evidence-based classroom management practices practices. Um, there are, like I said, we've got now the whole list of Lane and her colleagues, and she pulled from Herlacher's research and Hattie's research in the past. But this is a really great list, these five. Expectations, procedures and structure, active engagement, reinforcement, and management. And I want to show you a little bit about the effect size. I just now explained that to you a little bit. So the five principles of classroom management are listed here and look at the effect sizes of each of those of Herlacher's strategies. So we can see that most of them are close to 0.8, which is a high effect size. Um, those statisticians out there who have evaluated that, they have a big formula. I looked at it, it almost hurt, okay? Corinne, it hurt. But um, reinforcing expectations, look how huge that is, right? So reinforcement, which I've been spending most of the time on in these presentations, is the sweet spot of classroom management. It truly is. So um, this is a fuzzy little graphic, but just to show you the Cohen's rule of thumb of interpretation of effect size is that a medium effect is about 0.5 and a large effect is around 0.8 um, in research studies. So back to this to show you. Look at the ones that are near 0.8. Surprises me a tiny bit that active engagement is only a 0.6, but it's still bigger than the, the median, which is great. Um, and I'd love to see how current studies are showing the difference in that as well. So I have a resource here for you. I absolutely love um, one website that is amazing is midwestpbis.org. So in this website, you will see there's six, six snapshots, hard to say, of um, six snapshots for the six classroom strategies. Um, so again, that's a whole nother list different than Herlacher's, but I love these ones here that I want to point out to you today. Um, I didn't circle individual and group contingencies because I'm focusing on those this afternoon in my session, but in this session, I just wanted to say a few things about teaching behavior and routines, preventative prompts and behavior specific praise, and I kind of already did flesh through a little bit of behavior specific praise as well. So what I want to focus on with you is this idea of creating a classroom matrix. Has anybody ever heard before of a classroom behavior matrix? So Corey has because she's heard me talk about ad nauseum probably. Okay, so um, does anybody have a school-wide matrix in your school? And if you were in the keynotes yesterday with Dr. Lane, remember when she had that slide behind the guy's head, there was this grid well, that's what she was recommending was to project your school-wide matrix into it. Wasn't that snazzy stuff? Did you see that? How Dr. Lane yesterday had that behind the person's head? And she actually had this slide in one of the other sessions. Did you see that where she created a slide? She like geeked out over it that much that had a space for a person's body. You could just like take the slide and put that behind a person um, for their background. So if your school has a matrix, and in this example would be the Warren Way, um, then you can nest underneath of it your classroom rules, or you could even call them, you know, Miss Corbin's classroom expectations or whatever it is you want to call it, all right? I don't love rules as much as expectations. The Warren way is snazzy. I love that terminology. Then you want to flesh out underneath of those your routines and procedures. So the difference is procedures are laid out step by step and routines have become more automatic. So it's really just two sides of a coin. So whether I use those words interchangeably or not, that's what I mean by it. So that's what it could look like. And you have this entire, um, it's hyperlinked here, the whole snapshot that shows you more. Um, but I want to show you an article um, again, not scholarly, but a fantastic list. Procedures and routines to consider. So you have this in your folder as well, I hope. Um, I just want you to be able to skim through these and see what routines you could consider. I'm making it bigger for you. Just needs a sec. Whenever you're projecting in Zoom, things don't work as fast. But since I've already hit the button four times, I'm not gonna do it again for a second, okay? Because otherwise we'll have words real big. There we are. Okay, so here are some to consider. I'm trying to scroll down for you. And in that, you can pull the handout later and place a check by the ones you use daily. See, I told you guys this would happen. Sorry.
this is feeling like one of those tests school psychologists give about um, impulse control. Like how many times am I gonna hit the button? Okay, so here's some that you could think about. Entering the classroom when a student's tardy, when they're absent. I'll let you just skim through and look, look at those because you could have a written procedure for everything in the whole world. And if you did, you'd be just like me. Um, we're typically a very organized sort, us teacher people. And we like structure. So, you know, having a list in the bathroom of how to go for your toddler is okay. Just scrolling down for you so you can see more. Love the when visitors are in the classroom. So a lot of the schools I work with for a PBIS uh, school-wide matrix has a column of when we have a guest teacher or something like that. And if not, you can put it into your classroom matrix. So what I like to do with teachers is say, circle the ones, try to challenge yourself to circle the top six or something. Um, think about ones that could be in the same category by changing the terminology slightly. Like when, when there's a change or when there's a transition or when I need the teacher could cover three or four in each of those categories here. So you have the whole list in the handouts um, that are provided for you. When a student becomes ill, right? Okay, so you know, you could just think about how detailed to make that conversation. When a student is being disturbed, responding to a drill or bad weather, responding to school announcements. So these are great ideas to just kind of start from. So going back to the presentation, now that you have been able to consider those procedures and routines, then you could begin to build what we would call a classroom matrix. I shouldn't have gone back in because I want to show you the matrix template while I'm out. So this is a template that I have placed in your handouts as well. And I want to minimize so I can show you the whole thing in one spot here. So yeah, basically the Warren way was our example that was filled in. And you can find lots of example classroom matrix just by Googling and um, school-wide matrix just by Googling and get the ideas from that. You know, we learn from each other, but you can change. Uh, I did put this in a Word doc right in the handouts folder. So you could go ahead and do it like that. Or you could click on the link in the presentation and it's a view only. So it'll force you to make a copy anyway, and then you can change the headings however you would like. Um, but this gives you a chance to articulate one, two, three, four, five, six, I think six um, different routines or types of routines that you want to articulate for your learners. And imagine if your whole school had a classroom matrix, okay, in every room. Can you imagine how substitutes would love you they would love your school. They would say, I want to go to that school. Every classroom has this matrix. I know what to do when kids need to go to the potty. I don't just have to depend on the three who raise their hand, who I'm not sure whether they're screwing with me or not, but um, I actually know that it is true. And you could work this out that departments and grade levels form it together. Um, I would recommend that you have a school-wide matrix first because your school expectations should be the crux of this, the foundation. But um, hey, that's what PBIS is all about. So see me if you want to kind of explore this a little bit. But some schools, like, I don't think we even taught this out yet to CV um, staff. So this is the next step to go for your teachers. And there's um, some stuff we can do to work with them on building classroom strategies to nest underneath the school-wide PBIS strategies. So again, it just reminds you in here to make a copy and rename it, articulate your plan, and to see this as part of a systems approach. Okay, what time is this to be done? 1.15 or 1.30, Corey? 1.30. 1.30, cool. All right, doing okay. Because one, I'm like, sorry, wait, 1.15, sorry. 1.15, and the next yep. one starts at 1.30? 1.30, yep. Okay, so we do have a couple minutes then. Are there any questions? Usually I get a lot of questions on the classroom matrix idea. So I thought I wanted to pause and allow you to ask. Thanks, Elena. Mm -hmm. If you could give me a thumbs up, how many of you have a school-wide matrix already? Okay. There you go. So what if your school doesn't have a matrix? So you can develop a classroom matrix like this. Without it, it's not the best plan, but 
with our training that Phyllis and I and Jen are doing with PBIS, we are definitely not a throw the baby out with the bathwater team. So like, do you wait for school-wide consensus or do you move forward with the best thing for your classroom? So move forward with the best thing for your classroom while stoking the fires of PBIS and say, hey, you know, at the IU, they'll train us in how to have a school-wide matrix. It's really cool. The kids will know exactly how to act in all various situations. And we can definitely get you started on that. We'll have a cohort in the spring that's an in-person cohort. We're kind of hoping to do it in person, which is much more effective. But if we have to, we'll look at another virtual cohort, which we did this past spring to get you started. Um, so when you look at the template here, Miranda, you could simply, now here's my thought too, like the school that I principled last we had a solid set of district expectations, respect, responsibility, courage, and kindness, okay? What we hadn't done was articulated it in a building matrix because I didn't know what I didn't know. Could I kick myself and go back and implement PBIS now? I'd love to, right? They, they, they've moved on, so I'm okay with that. But um, I would love to have nested that in our school, what it looks like in the common areas, what it looks like when we have a guest teacher and things like that and had it all in one spot. But I probably would have just adopted, if we could have, the district expectations, were, which were adopted in a community format 10 years before that. There's publications and total buy-in all across the district and in the community. There were even community stakeholders at the table developing those four expectations. So if you have something like that, Miranda, in your district or school, that as a classroom teacher, you could go ahead and put in there as the school expectations. You feel like it's not solid and it's not fleshed out in the matrix yet, but they are in existence. You could go with that. Um, you could certainly take the good word back though and see if they'll want to develop one and get our support to do it. And the only people in the world, it's not like the only people in the world implementing PBIS are ones that we have taught how to do it. You might find that there's something like this in your school that, and that you haven't been trained, but that someone is implementing this. So change the headings and make it what you'd like and look for some examples as well. If you go on pbis.org, you can actually look up a virtual learning matrix article and just type in matrix and you'll get a bunch of articles and uh, there are examples in that of virtual learning matrices if you want to go ahead and transition over at a column for virtual learning in your school wide matrix. Um, you can certainly try to do that as well. Okay, so how's all this different in the inclusion classroom. And I'm going to tell you, I unashamedly read this up like a little sponge this morning and put this on here from Dr. Young. The team continues. This is about a school that's working on solving some problems. And she goes into explaining how the team is working together. The team continues discussing their plans and building an inclusive set of expectations for their students. They do not talk about what do we do about our special ed students because it's not even clear which of the teachers are special educators and which are general educators. What is clear is that all the teachers present value present value of the learning of all students. So if it goes into a lot of splintered conversation, we've got a cultural issue. So we come back to, are they all of ours? How can we share expertise? What is good for the few may be good for the many. And that's where one of you is an emotional support teacher. I can't remember which one. If you have anything to share on this, I would love to hear it. Eleni, do you have anything to say? Like, is that an amen from you? Can you tell us more? Okay. Yeah, I think I think this quote is is uh, very well put because you know, um, it it it's just not my students as emotional support students are the ones that I need because I've seen so many other students that are struggling, and a lot of the times those kids that are struggling that are like in those classes that are and, and are are not given those you know uh, they're not focused on those needs that they have then they become really major dis behavior issues and you get to see them like if sometimes when i walk the hallways i'll go in the cafeteria and i'm like yep i'm gonna have that student next because you can tell you know it's it's unfortunate and then you know and then you talk to your assistant principal and is and is like he's coming to you i'm working on it the the kids should not be in the office you know i back in the day we used to go to the office and we were terrified to go to the office. Now the kids are like, Oh, I get to go to the office. You know, uh, yeah. there's, there's a problem there. So, um, they need, I think every teacher needs to kind of develop this, you know, kind of embrace it and, and, uh, 
be the, be you know the sounding board or whatever the to to help all students out because they shouldn't be creating mm -hmm. special rooms for the behavior child because when when they do that and you go in there and you look at their just simply by just looking at their writing you can see that child mm -hmm. has you know has been left behind in the academics therefore you know they're going to misbehave so it's one of those cyclical patterns that i've been noticing where the the minute the kid does not know what what's going on in the classroom i'm going to act out because i don't want to look the fool in the classroom so then the behavior starts being visible more than the child so now teachers seeing behavior and then they're kind of seeing you know when they see a name in their classroom roster oh that's a behavior issue we're gonna have um issues with that child and they already are predisposed you know so i think they need to uh, you know to kind of like i said help the needs check what the what specific children need and do it school wide and then you won't you won't need a whole lot of uh other rooms for behavior modifications or for discipline issues you know the that you that's just my take oh gosh listen Elena, I, I could I could cry over all of it, all of that you just said, because it's so beautiful. It's better than I could have said it. That's my rationale for it. That is why I feel so gratified about teaching PBIS to schools, because if we can create a school-wide system that replicates the types of supports that we give to our neediest students, we will therefore decrease tier three, will we not? and put those needs into a tier two or the tier two needs into a tier one because we have provided interventions that are fluid and data-based and it's not forever, right? Special ed is not forever. Tier two is not forever. Tier three is not forever. Neither is the reason that the students were in it because students are whole learners. They might have a need for math that they don't have for reading and they don't have for, for behavior, but we tend to put them all in certain boxes and, and holes. And this is what keeps us stagnant and unflexible versus flexible and using an MTSS approach. And this is the quick way to say that, right? Check out this um, in, you know, in the inclusion classroom, we talk about, hang on, did I put a quote? There was a quote, look at this. When, when professionals focus on what can't happen, they're putting limitations on a student's ability to dream. So when we're looking at where do they belong, where are they going to be, and how are we going to fix this, it's not about fixing a particular student, it's about fixing a system, okay? And um, hang on, Miranda, go ahead. And I love that picture, right? It's like this precious person who could dream has now had limits and labels put on them. In the inclusion classroom, it's about establishing this culture of equity and inclusion and the beliefs that drive, it's, it's really about beliefs that drive your inclusive education and equity, okay? So this all comes into play with academics, with academic structures, procedures, scaffolds, supports, and and academics. You cannot separate the SEL pieces. So how do we involve our students, all of our students, in building expectations? So one way to handle this in an inclusive environment is have the kids help you build the expectations. Whose voice do you not hear in discussions like this? Are the right students at the table? How many times have they been in a situation where people will say, well, that student doesn't deserve to be on student council or student government because they don't have the grades? Okay, maybe, but where else are we hearing about the way they think the school should be improved to better meet their needs? Are we interested in changing the system or just that student? Um, it's okay to have both. We, we may be in the job of changing students, but we better be able to change students through changing the system. And um, my last, my principalship was five years in a building that had an emotional support population. So what Eleni was saying reminded me of this, and I will end here in just a minute um, for sake of your time. But all the time I kept thinking I had this global view of the building and if only I could marry and create rich collaboration between the special education team who were nowhere near perfect and neither was I and the regular education team so that they could share and communicate and truly be connected we could have a more inclusive environment so that it wasn't the ES teacher that was working their tail off to build relationship because when I saw that ES teacher called in on situations and we blurred the lines because that is healthy but we didn't always blur the lines in the opposite direction where a regular education teacher went out of their way to help a special education student and didn't make them go back for that help right but if we can blur those lines in both directions that teacher was just leaning down and talking close to that kid and communicating and building trust does that take a special education degree. 
does that take the title emotional support teacher for that to happen? Absolutely not. Okay, so they're all of our students. And are we intentional about accommodations and modifications for all learners, even if they are in the area of behavior? I missed the end of the area there. Even if they're in the area of behavior, can we modify and accommodate to build those skills? So how can we restructure any of these components for remote learning environments? I'm going to leave you with that question instead of fleshing it out. I think the most important thing we talked about was inclusion environments here. But when you think about remote learning, I think one of the biggest keys is that matrix for your remote learning setting. If you could have it behind your head and say, you know, here's what Ms. Heckman expects during a Zoom meeting or during a Google Meet, you know, here's what it's like when we respond through chat. You know, here's what it's like when we, you know, when we respond, when we ask a question, we, what, however you want to lay it out, it is flexible to your needs. Make it um, a communication tool for you because kids anxiety, like I said at the beginning of this, will reduce when they know what to expect and it's a laid out pr procedure routine that can be counted on for them. And in a world and a time when things are so um, uncertain for kids, we can maybe create pockets of certainty where we are articulating what we expect of them and that our expectations are high and positive for them. So your potential next steps are to identify items on the self-assessment that are securely in place for you. Identify items on that self-assessment that need attention and prioritize the components. Um, decide on a timeline for addressing them. Again, the onion doesn't unpeel in all layers at a time. It's one layer at a time. And um, cute story to end with. Uh, the other night I told my son we were going to make parfaits. He's four years old and he stops me. He interrupts, right? And I said, mommy, wait. I was like, wait a minute. I'm in the middle of a sentence. He's like, I know, but I want to tell you that all humans are like parfaits. <laughs> So it's one layer at a time and that comes from Shrek. So, you know, that was a timely quote. All humans are like parfaits. Um, we're multi-layered, but you need to do it one at a time and, and just schedule it out and then reach out for any support you may need. So I really appreciate you. You have these resources in your folder and uh, don't forget to do your evaluation for your Act 48. And there's the grid for today to find other sessions. I do have a session this afternoon on positive reinforcement, some implications for parents as well as educators at 245 if you would like to join. Thanks everybody.